I don't want to waste any more time, ladies and gentlemen, because she's already waiting to jump in here. So let's go ahead and get Moxie LaBouche from Your Brain on Facts in here. Moxie, welcome to the live stream for The Cure. So glad to be here. How are you guys doing this morning? I'm about to die. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> How are you this morning? You can die when the show is over, uh, as we used to say. Before. <laughs> uh, bright as a penny in the water. So can you uh, take a moment to tell our audience uh, what Your Brain on Facts is all about? Your Brain on Facts is your weekly half hour of things you didn't know, things you thought you knew, and things you never knew you never knew. I cover topics as wide-ranging as the history of nursing, the origin of the Vulcan salute, and the theft of Canada's strategic maple syrup reserve. <laughs> yes, and that's a thing, and someone stole it. <laughs> and uh, not only do you do you do a do you do a podcast or you doing a show, but you also have a book coming out. Yes, I'm so excited. On the 16th of June, Your Brain on Facts is available in uh, papery or e-book form, and you can uh, get your copy by going over to yourbrainonfacts.com slash book, or by all means, reach out to your local bookseller from a safe distance. And that is absolutely, absolutely amazing. And uh, so you today, um, you've brought some uh, some things that didn't quite make the cut, didn't quite make the final edit into the book. Is that correct? No. Um, Two-thirds of the book are topics that have never and will never be on the podcast. So what I have brought to you is an exclusive sneak peek of the book. Ah, that's right. My brain's broken. Don't pay attention to me. <laughs> See, Nick, this is exactly why. You need it's these okay. facts You've to go into your hard. brain. Well, Moxie, I will, I will, I will yield the floor to you. I will, uh, I will massage your swings. gray matter in this. The, the sways is always in command. <laughs> it's very true. So yeah, I will, I will yield the floor to, to yourself and the sways. We well, have a little a bit of an man, audio delay. Wise guys. friend of mine says. Uh, Yeah, there's a pretty good lag, but I'll be talking so con so nonstop you'll never notice. Well, as a, a wise friend of mine says, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you are. You've probably nearly detached your retinas. Well, there are people there who go a step further. Concave earthers. From Greek Tartarus to Hindu Patala, from the Aztec Michelin to the Christian hell, ancient or extant, myth or metaphor, every civilization that has stood on the earth has some version of an underworld. The living stay on top of the earth, the dead go beneath it, be it for a few years or for eternity. Our blue marble is made up of layers familiar to anyone who took earth science in school. You've got the crust, the mantle, the outer core, and the inner core. Beneath the soil we walk on and the rocks below it, Liquid magma surrounds a dense hot core made primarily of iron and nickel. But what if the Earth didn't have these layers? What if there was nothing inside the planet at all? That is the theory that some of the world's leading scientific minds espoused in the 17th century, that the Earth is actually hollow. The first person to broadly propagate, propagate this idea was someone whose name is inexorably tied to astronomy. The man who realized three reported comets were actually one comet and became that comet's namesake, Edmund Halley. In 1692, frustrated by anomalous compass readings that he couldn't explain, Halley proposed that the planet was a series of three shells, one inside the other, which spin in different directions at different speeds around a central core. Looks very much like a wind sculpture my mom has in her garden. According to his calculations of the Earth's magnetic field and the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, this model would explain away the inaccuracies of his compass readings. While he was on the topic, he posited that the spaces between the shells could have atmospheres capable of supporting life, and that gases escaping the outermost shell were the source of the aurora borealis. Holly's essays were popular, and while fellow scientists were intrigued by his geomagnetic data, few were as keen on his hollow earth theory. 
For the next few hundred years, the hollow earth idea floated around, changing slightly from each adherent to the next, like a geological game of telephone. Over time, the concentric shells gave way to an entirely hollow globe, with the core being a sun, a small sun that created ideal living conditions inside. The idea had some staying power, if only on the fringes of science. In 1818, John Cleve Sims Jr., a veteran of the War of 1812 and failed frontier trader with no apparent scientific education, published his Circular Number no. 1, pronouncing the earth to be hollow and, quote, stocked with thrifty vegetables and animals, if not men. Sims wrote, I declare the earth is hollow and habitable within, containing a number of solid concentric spheres, one within the other, and that is open at the poles 12 or 16 degrees. I pledge my life in support of this truth, and am ready to explore the hollow, if the world will support and aid me in this undertaking. Sims' version of the hollow earth theory included the unique addition of huge holes at the North and South Pole, which would come to be known as Sims holes that would allow sunlight to reach the world inside. Bonus fact, it's important not to confuse Sims Jr. with his uncle John Cleve Sims, full stop. He was a delegate to the Continental Congress, father-in-law to President William Henry Harrison, and great-grandfather of President Benjamin Harrison. Now, not content to theorize, Sim went on the lecture circuit to propose an expedition to the North Pole to locate and infiltrate the Sims Hole there to prove the existence of an inhabited concave to this globe. To hear him pitch the idea, the trek sounded like an easy one. Sims claimed that the navigable rivers flowed into the access portal at the poles. Sailors at the edge of one of the portals wouldn't even feel their ship descending into the interior of the planet, as undiscovered animals and even people were revealed. Enough people took notice, and a presumably emboldened Sims petitioned the U.S. Congress for two vessels of 250 or 300 tons. He had help from a wealthy Ohio man, James McBride, and Senator Richard Johnson, who became vice president under Martin Van Buren. The trio petitioned Congress for funding for years to no avail. But President John Adams said he would approve funding in 1828. Unfortunately for the Sims camp, Adam was succeeded by Andrew Jackson before the funding became official, and Jackson was, to understate things, not a fan of the idea. Sims passed away that same year. One person in whom Sims' ideas resonated was a young newspaper editor named Jeremiah Reynolds. While Reynolds believed the earth was hollow and accessible at the poles, the two men diverged over a stubborn disagreement over which pole would make the better expedition. Sims favored the North Pole, but Reynolds only wanted to mount an expedition to the South Pole. Reynolds was a more convincing public speaker than Sims, and had friendships he could leverage to get scientific groups to bombard Congress with letters of support for a government-sponsored South Pole exploration. Also striking out with the government, Reynolds joined forces with a wealthy patron to equip, provision, and man a ship for a year-long voyage. In 1829, eight years after the first man set foot on our Ant Antarctica, it is still a little early in the morning. Reynolds and his captain, M.B. Palmer, found themselves on a landmass that was much larger than they had anticipated. Certainly too large to search with no opportunity to reprovision themselves outside of the odd sea lion that the crew managed to kill. Reynolds decided the opening to the earth must be completely blocked by impassable ice, so they headed back stopping in Chile when the crew mutinied and put Reynolds and Captain Palmer ashore. After that, Reynolds abandoned his quest to prove the earth was hollow. In his, <clears throat> pardon me, in his Elements of Natural History in 1829, physicist Sir John Leslie included an end note describing his hollow earth theory, based on his theory of the compression of bodies. This theory was based on an experiment that Leslie believed established the compressibility of water. Even back then, most scientists accepted what we know now, water can't be compressed. 
The theory of the compression of bodies states that the density of any substance is a function of its elastic properties and its distance from the Earth's center. Leslie calculated that the Earth's core must be inconceivably dense, meaning Earth must be thousands of times more massive than Newtonian physics showed it to be. Accepting previous measurements of Earth's circumference, but holding fast to his density estimates, Leslie wrote, Our planet must have a very widely cavernous structure, and we tread on a crust or shell whose thickness bears but a very small proportion to the diameter of its sphere. The concept of an absolute vacuum had yet to enter the collective mind of science, so Leslie assumed something must fill this interplanetary void. Solids, liquids, and gases would all be subject to the intense compression he believed was in play, but light would not. The great central concavity is not that dark and dreary abyss which the fancy of poets has pictured. On the contrary, this spacious internal vault must contain the purest ethereal essence, light in its most concentrated state, shining with intense refulgence and overpowering splendor. The scientific community of the day rejected Leslie's theories about hollow earth and compression. He might have been completely forgotten, if not for Jules Verne, who credits Leslie as inspiration for Journey to the Center of the Earth that he wrote in 1864. Cyrus Teed was an alchemist and eclectic physician, or practitioner of botanical cures, in Utica, New York. During an 1869 ex experiment in electroalchemic research, Teed was knocked unconscious, whereupon he received a vision from the Divine Motherhood. She told him that he was the Messiah who must redeem the human race and explained the truth of the universe, which included the earth being hollow and mankind living inside it. When Teed came to, he adopted the name Koresh, the Hebrew form of Cyrus, and split his energy between the hollow earth and building a utopian community. Their motto? We live inside. Teed's inside-out universe was referred to as cellular cosmogamy. cosmogamy. In his 1898 book of the same name, he explained, The entire universe that we see in the sky lies within this cell, cradled in the hands of God. At the center of Teed's hollow, multi-layered earth is the sun, rotating on a 24-hour cycle creating the illusion of dawn and dusk. The sun is bright on one half and dark on the other. The dark side emits some light through many tiny openings that we interpret as stars. The Earth's crust is a hundred miles thick and made up of 17 layers. The outermost seven layers are metallic, five are minerals, and the innermost five are made of rock. The other planets in our solar system are flat disks floating between the metallic layers, while the moon is a reflection of the Earth's crust. We can't see straight across to the other side of the hollow Earth because the atmosphere is too thick. We are held to the ground by centrifugal force, not gravity. Outside our planetary cell is only the void. In addition to cellular cosmogony, Teed believed in reincarnation, celibacy, immortality, and collectivism, as did the people who joined him in his utopian communities, communities plural. The Koreshian Unity Community started in the 1870s in New York before moving to Chicago, where their commune was called Beth Orpa, then to San Francisco before settling finally in Estro, Florida. Moving the community around initially did help to spread Teed's message to small pockets of a few thousand people total, somewhat less than Teed's vision of a utopian city of 10 million, with streets up to 400 feet wide. New Jerusalem, as he called it, reached its peak when it had over 250 residents about 1905. The Koreshans built extensively, establishing stores, bakery, a print shop for their writings like their Flaming Sword newsletter, a power plant that supplied power to the whole region, and the community was extensively landscaped. They saw power in local politics with their progressive liberal party, but never got very far with that. 
Residents of New Jerusalem were divided into castes. Non-believers working with the community, who were free to marry and mate. The Department of Equitable Administration, who were allowed to marry, but only allowed to have sex for procreation. <clears throat> Pardonnez-moi, allergy season. And the celibate communal preeminent unity. Within each of these were secular, commercial, and educational branches. Day-to-day -day administration was the province of a council of women called the Seven Sisters, who lived in a house called the Planetary Court. Pardon me. Now that that <clears throat> polar vortex has moved through, the South has finally decided to be springtime, which means all of the pollen's going at once. Teed and his followers formed the Koreshian Geodectic survey in 1897 to scientifically prove the Earth's concavity. Phase one involved the help of an inventor called Ulysses Grant Morrow to project a horizontal line long enough, they claimed, to show that the concave ground was rising to meet it. Phase two required a specially constructed apparatus called a rectilineator that vaguely resembled a suspension bridge made of lumber and wire and functioned like a giant spirit level. If it worked, it would prove Teed's calculations that the Earth's surface curved upwards at eight inches per mile, and their reference line would meet the water about four miles offshore. It took a month just to construct and calibrate the rectilineator on a Naples, Florida beach. The rectilineator was only 12 feet long. The distance they were testing was over four miles long. The geodetic survey spent five months patiently moving and recalibrating the rectilineator along the beach. Their results proved mathematically that the Earth was concave, and Teed offered a $100,000 prize, almost $3 million today, to anyone who could prove him wrong. We will never know if Teed realized that the math that proved the Earth's surface was concave was the exact same math that proved it was convex. He maintained his theory until his death on December 22, 1908. The Koreshians, believing in reincarnation, kept his body above ground, expecting him to come back to life on Christmas Day. When there was no second coming, local authorities insisted the corpse be buried. The Koreshian unity began to splinter and fade almost immediately, though the colony still had members as late as 1961. And both Teed and Sims have monuments in their honor. The Koreshian State Historic Society and Ohio's Hollow Earth Monument. Because of course it's in Ohio. Don't at me. A decade or so after Teed's death, copies of the Koreshian's Flaming Sword newsletter found their way into a World War I French prisoner of war camp and into the hands of a German pilot, Peter Bender. Bender was taken with the idea of cellular cosmogony. Returning to Germany after the war, Bender developed and promoted the idea of, and here's where I'm counting very much on one quarter of my DNA to help me with pronunciation. Nope, it's not going to help. Whole Welt Lehr. Or the Hollow Earth Doctrine, which I'm just going to say it in English. A simplified version of Teed's theory, conspicuously devoid of religious references. Hollow Earth Doctrine drew some supporters, and while mainstream scientists were not among those, Bender was able to curry enough political favor to test his theory. The first test in 1933 was to launch a rocket straight up into the sky to see if it hit the opposite side of the planet. The rocket failed to launch and crashed a short distance away. Hermann Goering, with whom Bender had some connection from his pilot days, was instrumental in getting the second test approved. German Naval Research Institute officers thought that the Hollow Earth Doctrine might be useful in locating enemy ships. An expedition was launched to Rügen Island in the Baltic Sea to try to use telescopic cameras pointed upward at the supposed concavity to detect British ships. Bender claimed that the Earth's surface seemed convex because of the refraction of visible light passing through the atmosphere, so the cameras were fitted with infrared filters, as infrared radiation isn't refracted in the atmosphere. 
If Earth's surface were concave, the infrared photographs should show the position of British ships in the Baltic and North Seas. It did not. Nazi high command was embarrassed by the failure, and Bender, his wife, and some of his followers were sent to death camps. It bears noting that the depths to which the Nazis were truly invested in hollow earth and the fate of Bender and his crew, they are contested, with some sources claiming it's weird Nazi apocrypha, while others are steadfast on its veracity. Now, it would be nice to think that the belief in a hollow earth went out with big band music, but it has persisted even into the era where 3.2 billion people have near instant access to the collective sum of mankind's knowledge and wisdom. Beyond Halley, Sims, and Reynolds, modern hollow earth theory was also influenced by the 1892 novel The Goddess of Atfatabar, or The History of the Discovery of the Interior World. In the plot full of what becomes science fiction and fantasy tropes, the protagonist enters the interior of the globe through a Sims hole and finds an advanced civilization whose spiritual powers are capable of everything from maintaining youth to bringing the dead back to life. The eponymous goddess falls in love with the man, a civil war breaks out over their forbidden romance, and the man becomes their new king when he opens trade relations with the surface world. My conception of the hollow earth, based on my research, is that the shell of the earth is about 800 miles thick, from the outside to the inner surface, claims Rodney Clough, author of World Top Secret, Our Earth is Hollow. Like Teed, Clough believes the hollow earth contains a small sun with a day side and a night side, and like Sims, he believes that there are large openings at the poles. While there is variation of belief across modern hollow earth truthers, some common themes emerge. The inside of the earth is a tropical paradise that is home to an advanced race of beings that could be humans, aliens, giants, or some combination thereof. These people are the descendants of ancient races, the lost ten tribes of Israel, or the people of Lemuria, a mythical Atlantis-like land. They are peaceful and scientifically advanced to the point of having space travel technology, though one does wonder why they still live inside the planet then. The inner earth climate is so perfect as to grow giant plants and animals, like trees a thousand feet tall. This inner world is sometimes called Agartha, after a legendary earth core city from Eastern mysticism. Because white people would never appropriate Eastern stuff. If the inside of our planet is replete with giant animals and a race of large people with advanced technology, why have they never made themselves known? According to Clough, they have, but an international banking conspiracy has systematically suppressed the existence of Sims holes and the hollow earth that, leads, that they lead to. Side note, if you ever hear international banking conspiracy, uh, that's a dog whistle for the Jews. I'm saying that as a member of the tribe. That's the answer to the question of any and all missing evidence for the more conspiracy-minded hollow earthers. A favorite piece of suppressed evidence is a supposed secret diary belonging to Admiral Richard Byrd, three of the first people to fly over the, the first... Sorry, there's a typo in my book. That's disappointing. Supposed secret diary belonging to Admiral Richard Byrd, the first person to fly over the North and South Poles. According to this diary, Byrd's plane was intercepted by a flying saucer, which landed it remotely. On the ground, he was met by emissaries who expressed their concern about the atomic bomb and appointed him their ambassador to the surface world and to the U.S. government. We will leave aside the fact that Byrd flew to the North Pole 21 years before the first atom bombs were dropped in World War II? If no other expedition had produced irrefutable proof of a hollow Earth, Clough would have to launch an expedition of his own. Voyage to the hollow Earth was set to leave from Murmansk, Moscow, in a Russian icebreaker ship in June 2007. Interested parties could buy their way into the expedition for 20,000 U.S. dollars. 
after a projected nine days on foot, the expedition would travel up Hidekel River to the city of Jua, before taking a monorail trip to the city of Eden to visit the palace of the king of the inner world. The itinerary contained a backup plan in the event that they couldn't locate the Sims Hole. Please note that if we are unable to find the opening, we will be returning via the New Siberian Islands to visit skeleton remains of exotic animals thought to originate from Inner Earth. For better or worse, Voyage to the Hollow Earth never got past the planning stages. One of the organizers passed away from cancer, appropriate, Another was killed in a plane crash, and a third was forced to withdraw after the largest investor in his company threatened to pull their financial support if he publicly persisted in his hollow earth beliefs. These setbacks were also blamed on the international banking conspiracy. Subsequent attempts met with the same results. Still, Clough wasn't deterred. There are tons of people who have expressed interest in this expedition if we can get it off the ground. I don't think there are a lot of people out there, certainly not in the millions, but maybe in the thousands. Which I think is a very optimistic estimate on his part. But would you guys like to help me pick out the next section of the book to read? Or maybe somebody in the chat? I think I have a different chat window than the live stream chat window. But this is, and pardon me, my first time ever on Twitch. And I have to keep leaning side to side because my webcam is a, um, sitting on a block of wood in front of my tower computer. It looks better than mine. Mine's actually, my microphone's sitting on top of an old CD case, like the huge old CD booklet. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's still two floating around my house, and I have no idea why. <laughs> and I can't, I can't bear to get rid of them, though, because they're so useful, even though they're not useful in the slightest anymore. Memories. Nostalgia, I guess, so, possibly. Pick a number. Yeah. I am definitely getting old, because the more, like, pop music I hear, the more, like, ugh, the music I listened to in high school was so much better. I'm like, oh, my God, I sound like my uncles. <laughs> Just think, I'm definitely there. But uh, there are seven chapters in the book, so uh, pick a number between one and seven. Lucky seven. Okay. Oh, well, why don't we read the section Swiss Army Wife? And this is one that has appeared on the podcast, but it was a long, long time ago, and I have uh, updated some of the information before it went to print. I am, uh, I'm actually going to skip over the book exclusive part of uh, chapter seven, which is entitled The Little Child Shall Lead Them, because one or two bits are kind of a downer, especially for 1030 on a Saturday morning. So if you want to find out what I'm talking about, you just have to get the book. But from the section Swiss Army Wife. It's not uncommon across the world and throughout history for a woman who has been widowed to take over her husband's business. And that's fairly easily done with a store or a ranch. But what if your late husband earned his bread in the U.S. Congress? Surprisingly, there is an official protocol known as widow's succession or widow's mandate. Quote, widow's succession used to be the way that women got into Congress, with very few exceptions, explains Debbie Walsh from the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University. Not dissimilar from a queen regent ruling until the heir came of age, the idea behind the practice was continuity, the notion that the woman would complete the work her husband had started. It was not a blue moon occurrence either. 47 women have taken over their husband's seat, eight in the Senate and 39 in the House. Neither was it an old-timey system that has been long forgotten. The practice actually peaked mid-20th century, and at the time of this writing, two widows are still serving. Quote, there was a period when you could look at all the women serving in Congress, and a majority had initially gotten in that way, says Walsh. In most cases, wives govern similarly to their husbands, though there have been some notable exceptions, like California's Mary Bono, 
who is significantly more conservative than her late husband, Sonny Bono. The greatest ideological difference occurred in the 1920s and 30s, when the widows tended to govern more moderately than their husbands had. Let's say hypothetically that your husband had not died, but instead been incapacitated by a stroke. And for the sake of argument, he was not a congressman, but the president of the United States. In October 1919, First Lady Edith Wilson unofficially ran the U.S. government in lieu of the 28th president. In the aftermath of World War I, President Woodrow Wilson suffered a series of medical crises, culminating in a stroke that permanently paralyzed the left side of his body and blinded his left eye. While he was bedridden for the next two months, only his wife, his doctors, and a few very close associates were allowed in to see him. The First Lady effectively took over many of the presidential duties, including reviewing various important matters of state. She would not even consider having her husband resign and forsake his dedication to his office. The first move in establishing what she called her stewardship was to mislead the entire nation, from the cabinet to the press, by only permitting an acknowledgement that Woodrow badly needed rest. When the cabinet members began, came to confer with the president, they would go no further than the first lady. If they had policy papers or pending decisions for him to review, edit, or approve, she would first look over the material. If she deemed the matter pressing enough, she took the paperwork into her husband's room and closed the door. As bizarre as the scenario seems, officials waited in the hall. When she came back to them after conferring with the president, Mrs. Wilson turned over their paperwork, now riddled with indecipherable margin notes that she said were the president's transcribed responses verbatim. This is how she described the process. I myself never made a single decision regarding the disposition of public affairs. The only decision that was mine was what was important and what was not, and the very important decision of when to present matters to my husband. Luckily, the nation faced no great crisis for the year and five months of her stewardship. Those 17 months did not go totally smoothly, though. When she heard that the Secretary of State had convened a cabinet meeting without Wilson's permission, she considered it an act of insubordination, and he was fired. Half a world away, and four centuries earlier, a Mapuche woman named Junkio led her fallen husband's troops into battle. The Mapuche are a tribe native to Chile, who, like the other tribes of the New World, found themselves besieged by Spanish conquistadors. The Mapuche had held the Spanish off for decades, thanks to their strong forts, one of which was captained by Jonquillo's husband, Hupotian. Like many of their people, Hupotian was captured by the Spanish, tortured, and killed. The news of his death filled Jonquillo with rage, and which she focused to lead her people in retaking the fort from the Spanish and gathered an army of thousands. Not merely a tactician or figurehead, Junquillo was a fierce and skilled warrior in her own right, personally defeating a Spanish commander whose head she mounted on her spear. The Spanish doubled and redoubled their efforts, bringing all available military might to bear on the Mapuche. Eventually, Junquillo and her army were forced to abandon their fort and flee into the jungle. And this is where Junquillo passes out of history and into legend. But the Mapuche continued their fight. They were able to resist conquest until the 1880s. Now, we don't know how old Junquillo was when she took command of her army, but we do know the age of one Mary Patton when she took control of her ailing husband's clipper ship in 1856. She was 19 and pregnant. Though it was rarely done and often thought to be bad luck for women to be aboard, Patton was allowed to accompany her husband Joshua on his voyages as captain of the merchant clipper Neptune's car. She used the long days at sea wisely, studying medicine and navigation. Joshua was already unwell when he was forced to order the first mate placed under arrest for dereliction of duty, which left him to do the work of two people. When he could no longer captain the ship, Mary took over for him. She set the course and navigated the vessel. She also nursed Joshua, at one point shaving his head to reduce his fever. 
During rough seas, she had to tie him into his bunk while she carried on the navigator duties. The first mate tried to persuade Patton to release him from the brig. When that failed, he tried to persuade the crew to mutiny against her and Joshua. Patton was able to convince them to remain loyal to their captain. The journey from New York to San Francisco took the Neptune's car 130 days, during which Patton nursed Joshua through a second illness. Once they reached the port in San Francisco, Patton became an instant celebrity and received a $1,000 bonus, at least $25,000 today, from the shipping line for her heroics. Patton said she had performed only the plain duty of a wife toward a good husband. Where one ship helped Mary Patton care for her husband, it took many ships to help Jean de Clisson avenge hers. Born in 1300 to a wealthy and influential noble family in Breton, France, Jean was married at age 12 to a man with whom she had two children. After her first husband's death, she married Olivier de Clisson and had five children with him. Since their wealth was substantial, Olivier was enlisted by a friend to help defend Breton against the forces of English sympathizer Jean de Montfort. And by the way, if you ever hear anybody make that incredibly tired crack that uh, France is, you know, or the French are cowardly, the, the white, the national flag of France is a white flag, just tell them to study English history. France has never been shy about war. They just didn't want to go in that particular war with us. Anyway, during the Breton War of Succession, Olivier came under suspicion of treason. In 1343, the French arrested, tried, and sentenced Olivier to death by beheading. News of her husband's death ignited a great rage in Jean de Clisson. Her revenge against French nobility, military, and King Philip VI began with a visit to her fort, to the fort her husband had once commanded. The new captain recognized her and opened the gate, but de Clisson was not alone. Her troops stormed the fort. By the time the crown sent reinforcements, the fort was burning. De Clisson sold all of her lands and holdings, raising enough money to create her soon-to-be infamous Black Fleet. With these ships, she attacked French ships under the cover of fog in the English Channel. News of the arrival of the Lioness of Brittany quickly spread across Europe. The Black Feet Fleet was eventually overtaken, though. De Clisson escaped in a rowboat with her children. Did I forget to mention she had her children with her? She rowed the boat for five days and nights until they reached England. Impressed with her power and having no love for the French, King Edward III gave her more ships, and Jean set out again. Her quest for revenge continued with the same intensity, even after King Philip VI died in 1350. In 1356, after 13 years of piracy, and for reasons not in evidence, Jean de Clisson retired from her career in vengeance and lived the rest of her days in England, getting married a third time. Now, a husband need not die for his wife to help him do his job. Some of cinema's most iconic movies would not be what they are today if not for a spouse in the editing room. Take the work of Alfred Hitchcock. Alma Revel was arguably the only person to whom Hitchcock would defer to in the filmmaking process, and usually not easily. Having begun her career at age 16, Revel was already an experienced editor and continuity girl, a real job title back then, when she met Hitchcock. And by the way, watch the opening of Bond movies, the early ones, and you will see continuity girl listed in the credits. Their working relationship began when he was made assistant director of the movie Woman to Woman and wanted her as editor. The salary that Revels was offered was so low, she literally walked away from the project, only to have Hitchcock race down the corridor after her to make her a better offer. They would marry three years later. For the groundbreaking movie Psycho, Hitchcock wanted there to be no music in the famous shower scene only the sounds of the running water and actress Janet, Janet Lee's screams. It was Revel who convinced him that the staccato strings of composer Bernard Herrmann were the right choice. Revel also caught a few frames that had gotten past everyone else and may have undermined the impact of the whole scene. 
when Lee was laying supposedly dead in the tub, you could clearly see her swallow. And bonus fact, the psycho shower scene, which is quite the tongue twister, was pretty tame to shoot. It was Revel's editing that made it so intense. Janet Lee was so alarmed by what she saw during the first screening, she never took a shower again in her life if she could avoid it. If it was unavoidable, she would leave the shower open and the bathroom door open. Unbelievably, Hitchcock never won an Oscar for directing, but he did receive the American Film Institute's Lifetime Achievement Award at age 79. In his acceptance speech, he said, I beg to mention by name only four people who have given me the most affection, appreciation, encouragement, and constant collaboration. The first of the four is a film editor, the second a scriptwriter, the third is the mother of my daughter Pat, and the fourth is as fine a cook as ever performed miracles in a domestic kitchen. And their names are all Alma Revel. The personal relationship of working duo Marcia Lucas and her husband George was not so rosy, even though her work editing Star Wars made it the film that launched a media empire. Marcia was the only Lucas to bring home an Oscar, along with her fellow editors Paul Hirsch and Richard Chu. Like Alma Revel, Marcia was an accomplished film editor in her own right, working under the likes of Martin Scorsese. George Lucas's original cut of the film was not the space opera Western fairy tale we know and love today. The opening text crawl was painfully long. The pacing was slogging. The plot was unclear. It was bloated with unnecessary backstory. There were jokes where jokes didn't fit, and the focus shifted in ways that made no sense. Marcia com and company rearranged the scenes to create tension where it was needed, trimmed redundant exposition, including removing entire characters, improved the pace, and gave the audience the correct amount of information. It was even Marcia's idea for Obi-Wan Kenobi to die. George Lucas didn't win any of the Oscars he was nominated for, but Marcia, Hirsch, and Chu won for Best Editing. George and Marcia Lucas divorced in 1983, and Marcia became a minor footnote in the history of the franchise, rarely mentioned and never quoted. There is conjecture that George actively worked to suppress her contributions. For example, he put scenes back in that she had taken out, like the scene with Han Solo and Jabba the Hutt at Mos Eisley, which is just one more reason to hate that scene. Now, not every creative husband appreciates their equally creative wife, and not everyone appreciates the amazing person their partner is. Martha Gellhorn was a war correspondent reporting on the Spanish Civil War in 1939 when she fell in love with another correspondent, Ernest Hemingway. Side note, when you are done watching the amazing live stream this weekend, go on YouTube and look for a, a puppet, of all things, called Randy Feltface and his three-minute summation of the life and times of Ernest Miller Hemingway. It is the best three minutes you will spend, I promise. The couple moved to Cuba and married, whereupon Hemingway apparently expected Gellhorn to tie on an apron and keep house. Instead, Gellhorn continued traveling to far-off lands to report on conflicts. Hemingway resorted to undermining her career by snagging the sole press credential her employer had issued to cover the D-Day invasion. Not about to be scooped by her husband, Gellhorn talked her way onto a hospital ship and hid in the bathroom overnight. When she emerged, the invasion was underway. The ship she was on was the first hospital ship to arrive, and all hands were desperately needed. Gellhorn fetched food and bandages, water and coffee, and helped interpret where she could. When night fell, she was ashore at Omaha Beach with the medics, not as a journalist, but as a litter bearer to recover the wounded, flinging herself into the icy surf behind the minesweepers. Gellhorn was the only member of the press to have been near the battle. Hemingway and the rest watched through binoculars from a safe distance. Hemingway's coverage received far more attention, but the truth had been written. There were 160,000 men on that beach, and one woman. 
Gellhorn and Hemingway divorced less than a year later, and Gellhorn continued covering wars into her 80s. And what I love is that my publisher put a picture of Hemingway and Gellhorn in the book and put uh, Gellhorn and her husband. Because I think she need, deserves a lot more of the credit. So would you like another section or do we want to do some rapid fire bonus facts? Well, we're about, looks like 12 minutes into the hour. Um, it's totally up to you, but some rapid fire bonus facts would be pretty rad in my opinion. All right. Let me get some up. Yeah. I used to do stand up, And one thing that uh, every single stand up agrees on, you do your full time. Usually five minutes and not an hour, but yeah, you got to do your full time. Did you know that a horse is actually 15 horsepower on average? That one really, really threw me because I thought it must be one horsepower. That's why they call it horsepower. Nope. I got to take another quick sip of water. Excuse me. The first version of Toy Story. Woody was not a cowboy. He was a ventriloquist dummy, and he was a creepy sadist at one point pushing Buzz Lightyear out a window. If you look on YouTube, you can find some early test footage they had made, and you will be so grateful that they changed their mind. That actually sounds right up my it's alley. <laughs> yeah, it's not full on goosebumps, but it's pretty bad. It's, it's not good. I, they definitely would have altered the the trajectory of CGI movies and the big companies that produce them, I think, if if Woody had been a sadistic ventriloquist dummy. I think the world would have just been like, nope, we don't need any more of this. The standard issue female CPR training dummy called Recessian got her face from the death mask of a young woman who drowned in the Seine River in Paris. The death mask was made so that her family could hopefully later identify her. But it was very popular with local artists who bought copies of the mask to act as inspiration. It's a bit nebulous as to how that face actually got from artist inspiration to CPR training dummy. Speaking of France, an expert sword fighter once stole a corpse that they planned to leave in the bed of their lover when they sprung her from a convent, which they would burn down behind them. The swashbuckler's name? Julie Daubney, age 19. The movie Heaven's Gate put United Artists Studios out of business after the director's demands tripled the budget, with things like antique trains that required a different gauge of track to be laid. 250 extras that had to be taught to ice skate with old-timey skates, and 1,200 extras who need to be taught to ride horses, drive wagons, and use whips correctly. By day six of filming, they were already five days behind schedule. The British Navy still had daily rations of rum for sailors until July of 1970. The U.S. Navy still issued their sailors bell-bottoms until 1999. I know that one because my husband still has his. He doesn't fit in them, but he has them. There are more plastic flamingos in the world than real flamingos. Most people have heard the fact that there are more tigers in captivity in the U.S. than there are wild in the rest of the world. And this one's going to bum you the hell out. There are more juggalos in the world than there are polar bears. I should have mentioned earlier, I am not liable for your therapy bills. Sorry. The man who created Flaming Hot Cheetos was a custodian at Frito-Lay at the time. He had taken some unflavored Cheetos home and coated them with elote with street corn seasoning. And he is now an executive at PepsiCo. Between the 1 million people who died as a direct result of the Irish potato famine and the 2 million that fled the country, the population of Ireland is still not back at pre-famine levels. 
The Six Flag amusement park chain began with one park in Texas that was only open for 45 days its first year. The Six Flags refer to the six nations that at one point or another governed Texas. Anne Frank, Martin Luther King Jr., and Barbara Walters were all born in 1929. And it's almost strange to think of them all being in the same timeline. American Samoa was one of the only inhabited places in the world not to see a single death from the 1918 Spanish flu. The governor there took the reports he was hearing over the radio seriously, and he locked down the ports. He, in fact, ordered any ship that tried to make birth be treated as an enemy combatant and sunk. Hopefully you've heard at some point, as more people become familiar with the 1918 flu, it is called the Spanish flu not because it originated in Spain, but because this happened during World War I, and Spain was neutral, though still kind of involved. The other governments of Europe and of America didn't want their enemies to know how bad this flu thing was getting, so they had media blackouts on it. Spain was neutral barely had a dog in the fight, so they reported on it freely. So a lot more stories of flu came out of Spain. In fact, the best information we have right now is that the 1918 flu started on an army base in Kansas. So we should be calling it the Kansas flu, if anything. For the last hundred years or so, many people in South Korea have believed that leaving a fan on overnight in your bedroom will kill you in your sleep either by suffocating you or freezing you. The exact origin of the belief is unclear, but suspicion has fallen on the South Korean government starting the rumor during the 1970s energy crisis to get people to use less electricity. Only two of the 195 countries in the world have a flag that doesn't have red or white or blue on it. Those are Jamaica and Mauritania. Two flags are also square rather than rectangles, Switzerland and Vatican City, and only one is not a quadrilateral at all. That is the flag of Nepal, which is two triangles. The founder of the Lindt Chocolate Company was killed in 1918, not in the Great War, but when one of his boilers exploded. There is a car race called the 24 Hours of Lemons, it's not Le Mans, I know how to pronounce that. Lemons. The cars have to be purchased and repaired for under $500, not including the cost of mandatory safety equipment like a roll cage, a kill switch, and a fire suppression system. Unsportsmanlike behavior receives creative punishments from the judges, like having to walk a lap carrying a sign that says, I am a big jerk. The Australian Aboriginal language of Juju Yi, me, nope, not going to do it, sorry, has no word for left and right. Speakers refer to things based on the cardinal directions. So I might be holding this pen in my west hand, but if I turn around, it'll be in my east hand. Orange the color is named for orange the fruit. Before the word was adopted, the color orange was just called yellow-red. In ancient Egypt, and this one's relevant for anyone who's watched the Hulu series The Great, which I fairly recommend except for the fact that the writers don't know how to swear correctly. In ancient Egypt, women who thought they might be pregnant peed on wheat and barley seeds. The hormones of pregnancy would help the grain to sprout, and which grain sprouted would tell you the gender of the baby. Amazingly, it's about 70% accurate. In 1847, a showboating surgeon performed a leg amputation in 25 seconds. The patient died. The surgeon was going so fast, he cut two fingers off of his assistant, who got an infection and died. And a spectator of the surgery died of a suspected heart attack. It is the only known surgery in history with a 300% mortality rate. Queen Amidala's formal costumes in Star Wars The Phantom Menace are similar to the last queen of Mongolia, who was executed by the Soviet Union in an attempt to destroy Mongolian culture. 
absolutely do a Google image search for that. To study how our words for colors affect our perception of color, one researcher raised his daughter without identifying the color blue by name to her. When asked at the age of four what color the sky was, she said it was white. Pineapples do not grow on palm trees. They grow on shrubs that are about three foot high, with one fruit apiece that can take up to three years to grow. According to estimates from the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. has used 4.5 gigatons of cement in the 20th century. Compare that to the 6.6 gigatons of, of cement that China used between 2011 and 2013. Due to the structure of their larynx, whether they have an effigial bone or a ligament, cats that can purr, like house cats and lynxes, can't roar. And cats that can roar, like lions and jaguars, cannot purr. And I'm coming up on my time, so here is one more for you. Violet Jessup was a stewardess and nurse aboard White Star Line passenger ships. She survived the sinking of the Titanic, which hit an iceberg, the sinking of the Britannic, which hit a sea mine, and the sinking of the Olympic, which collided with a British warship. She was dubbed Miss Unsinkable. And that is your brain on facts. Wow. I, I love you, Moxie. You know what my favorite thing is, because I'm one of Sean's patrons. If you're not a patron of, of, of Sean Ennis or of Your Brain on Facts or Oh No Lit Class or... The Velvet Drizzle. The Velvet Drizzle. Or The Meat Machine, as he's... Conspiracy Theoryology. Known. Yes, Conspiracy Theoryology. Uh, they do an amazing game yeah, show. Yeah, I'm not as much on board with that. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I did want to shout out, we got numerous donations there during I can during go one better, segment. though. So we got uh, Jared Taylor, $8.55. We had Alan from Interrupted Tales, $15. I love Moxie. Uh, Paul from the Varmints Podcast, I'm glad to see he's still okay. Uh, $10. Moxie is the best. Uh, Rob, the Moxie hype is real. And then Maria Reyes, $20. Rob also donated $20. So we are up to eighty six ninety in total. Thank you so, so much, Moxie. And please let our audience know uh, where they can find your brain on facts. Oh, just happy to help. Your Brain on Facts is available on all podcast players or at yourbrainonfacts.com. And if you go to yourbrainonfacts.com slash book, you can get my voice in paper form. And as soon as I am done doing my bit here, I am going to be putting uh, $18 toward the cause once I figure out how this is my first time using Twitch. <laughs> Well, thank you so, so much, Moxie. Right down below the screen, there's a big box that just says donate. We made it as easy as possible. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. Good. A, a nice, clear call to action. Exactly. Thank you so, so much for being here, Moxie. We're going to say thank goodbye you. to Moxie, and we are going to be welcoming me, my demon, and I. And I believe Dan will be sending them over momentarily.